podcasting down in South America is exploding right now. And it's uh, happening more and more in Europe and in Asia. It's really starting to you know, expand. Canada actually has a higher per capita podcast listening stats than the U.S. So there's more people listening to more podcasts on a weekly and monthly basis in Canada than in the U.S. So if that gives you any kind of indication of where this medium is heading, it's truly becoming a global medium. Welcome to Podcasting Made Easy. I'm your host, Christine O'Donnell, a journalist, podcast producer, and media coach. This podcast is a resource for podcasters that breaks down what it takes to launch a podcast and grow that podcast brand and business. So let's get you started. Hi, Rob. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Podcasting Made Easy. Rob Greenlee has been podcasting since the beginning of podcasting. He is now the VP of Content and Partnerships at Libsyn, the world's largest media hosting company. Rob's held lead positions at Spreaker, VoxNest, and Podcast One. He was inducted into the Academy of Podcasters Hall of Fame in 2017 and is one of the most open people I have met in the podcasting world. Wow. Thank you for the, for the wonderful introduction. It's well, great to be on your show, Christine. Yeah. Thank you for being here. And you also have a podcast you co-host um, called The New Media Show, and that comes mm-hmm. out every Saturday. Most Saturdays. We're, we've been doing it on Fridays lately, but that's just because my co-host has been traveling. He's been moving his whole studio. So soon we'll be back doing it every Saturday morning. So, oh, and your yeah. co-host is Todd Cochran from Blueberry. Correct. Correct. He's the CEO and the, the founder of the Blueberry platform, which has the PowerPress plugin for WordPress and has been involved in podcasting since even back when I started. Uh, he's been doing a podcast since 2005 and I started in 2004. Um, so we, we've been around the medium a long time. So we've been doing that new media show for about 11 years. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, what have you seen happen over those 11 years? Well, um, I've, been, <laughs> I've been podcasting since 2004 and then working in the background, helping other podcasters um, through most of that time. I mean, I had my own ra- uh, uh, radio show for many years. I started in 1999, uh, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the program, but um, it's it's been... Um, it's been quite a quite a journey, and I know that there's a lot of stuff to talk about, um, you know, with, with this medium. But that that show I do every week with Todd is really all about the podcasting space and the industry and the development of the of the medium and the big issues and trends. It's it's a it's a show that if you want to hear frank conversations about what's going on in the podcasting space, it's probably probably one of the best shows out there for that because um, we. Th- talk about topics that are sometimes a little taboo to talk about much. So, and I'm not sure why they're taboo. It's just, I guess there just hasn't been much of a forum and willingness amongst podcasters to, to really pull back the, the um, curtains on what really goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, something. So I was listening to your latest podcast and it seemed like there's some scary stuff going on, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to people who are podcasting specifically to make money. Right. That Which that ad is, spend could go down significantly. Well, it's, there's always a danger of that, right? If we head down a, you know, one path or another, right? Um, things can work out good or they can work out bad. And, and that has been the case with podcasting really since it started. I mean, podcasting, and a lot of people don't realize this, but when this medium started, uh, it was not cool to run an ad in your podcast. So um, it was really a stick it to the man medium when this medium started. And I think a lot of people need to understand the culture of where we have come from uh, with this medium. This was a this medium was a reaction to uh, people really getting fed up with radio um, and the over over commercialization of radio. And then also when this medium started was at the tail end of um, the, the whole music pirating thing that was going on with Napster and all that kind of stuff. So uh, this was a reaction to the cultural shift that was happening with the internet um, back in those days. 
And, and so what we've seen is kind of more acceptance of the commercialization of this medium. And I think some of us that have been around for a long time are a little bit cautious about um, pushing too hard on that. Um, but also keeping in mind that not all podcasters want to run advertising in their show. And we need to think about that and make sure that we support the, that kind of thinking as well. Not, not every show has to have advertising to be successful either. What does that mean? Well, it just means that this is an open medium and it's open to a lot of um, ways of doing things. It, we don't have to standardize everything about this medium and it doesn't have to be viewed as a primarily a commercial medium. And I think as big money and big, big financial interests get involved in the medium, there's a lot of pressure to do that, right? It is to make changes to the medium that make it more favorable to making money versus making terrific content. And I think that's the, that's the pull that the medium has had over the last, probably the last five or six years is that there's been this gravitational pull of attention um, that's been focused on monetization and making money from the medium versus um, where the attention should really live. And that's around um, the, the creation of terrific content. Yeah. Is that how you would define a successful podcast? Um, I think a successful podcast is um, around building community and around creating connections with real people. And I think um, once you've done that, you can, you, you have options. You can monetize, you can run advertising, you can sell a book, you can become viewed as an expert in your medium and get a better job. Um, those are all things that I've, I've gotten at, out of podcasting in the 15 years that I've been involved in it is that it's helped me with my career. I've also made, made revenue from advertising, but I've also done shows that were not commercial, didn't run any advertising in it, but I still got a lot of value out of doing that. So I think we just have to view this medium as a, as basically a blank canvas of opportunity that you can do what you want and, and not feel like you, you have to conform to something um, that um, isn't right for you. And I think that's, that's what's different about this medium compared to radio or television or other forms of medium that have been taken over by a very aggressive commercial interests. Yeah. So um, people shouldn't feel discouraged. No, I think that the opportunities are still um, as, as bright as they've ever been. Sure. It's much more competitive now because there's a lot more shows um, there's actually, I think the numbers that came out just this week is around 280,000 podcasts have created a new episode in the last 90 days. Um, so as far as active days. podcasts, yeah, exactly. So as far as active podcasts, there's about 280,000 shows, um, though there's about 706,000 shows that have ever been published into the Apple podcast platform that are currently in that catalog today. Now, Apple has been purging. Uh, I think they've purged um, tens of thousands of shows o over the last 90 days or so that are, you know, dead feeds or content that uh, doesn't need to exist anymore in their catalog. So there's been a certain amount of weeding out, and I know Apple's had a lot of um, changes to their their kind of uh, a review process of um, what their willing to accept in their catalog around metadata and, and, you know, keyword, you know, stuffing and things, you know, having like titles of your podcast that have like 15 different keywords off of the title, you know, those are kind of spam techniques and they've been, they've been purging shows that are, are doing those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, changes are happening in the medium, but I think they're all positive changes. That's good. That's good to hear our listeners, I'm sure, um, are, are curious about the future of the podcasting world. And um, I'd love to talk about that in this podcast and how new podcasters can grow and succeed in this space. So some of the things I wanted to touch on, and I feel there's some jargon in the podcasting world. When I first started, I was like, oh, what's this? What's that mean? What does this mean? And I still sometimes I'm like, wait, what are they talking about right. in reference to um, perhaps different 
media hosts or content providers or servers or services or applications. There's so many different terms. And as you are an OG in the podcasting world, (laughs) would you care to kind of go through some of them with me to make it really easy for our listeners to understand what is what? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly certainly do. I wanted to make a comment about the OG part. I'm I'm still not clear what the OG means. Is it um, old guy, old guard, old? You no. Know, anyway, I'm just teasing you. If we, you don't, so you do know what it means. I'm like, let me go to I Urban do. Dictionary. I was like, you know, what, I'm not really. I can think of a bunch of things that it means, and I've heard a lot of people use that 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 terminology, and I I'm. I'm cool with it. Don't it's get me a compliment. Wrong. I know it is. I <laughs> I I fully appreciate that. Um, but but anyway, to to get into what you're um, asking about, um, yeah, there there is a lot of jargon in this medium, and and I think it can be confusing, to, uh, especially to new podcasters that have not been, you know, um, involved in the medium for a significant amount of time to to, to learn all this stuff. Um, and I think one of the the ones that keeps popping up and there's new jargon terms that are invented all the time, like uh, um, pod fasters. I don't know if you've heard of that one before, but those are podcast listeners that, um, that listen at like double speed, Um, you know, like two and a half times. It's like this pound your chest kind of thing. I listen to podcasts at three times speed. Um, or some people listen at one and a half times speed. And then there's the OGs that listen at real time speed, right? Like, like me, I, I don't listen to double time because I can't keep up with it. And especially if you have a podcaster that speaks really fast, you don't want to listen to it at double speed because they'll be like talking like this and you really can't hear anything because they sound like Mickey mouse, you know? So, so that's one term there. There's um, uh, pod fading. Um, which is basically a podcast that starts um, and then after seven episodes, they kind of stop producing episodes. And that's, that gets back that differential between the 280,000 and the 700,000 is that the difference between those are shows that have pod faded. And I've pod faded over my 15 years. I think I've pod faded like three shows. So um, I know exactly what, what's going on there. There's a lot of reasons that cause pod fading. And then there's pod quitting, which is basically you just stop doing the podcast abruptly. Most podcasters um, decline gradually, right? Or they set a last episode date sometime in the future or something like that, or um, life gets in the way and that's when they pod quit. So there's all sorts of these fun little terms in you know, and then there's the more practical terms like uh, uh, media hosts, which are podcast hosting, which is like what uh, Lipson does or, you know, I used to work for Spreaker and Spreaker's, you know, and Lipson are both um, podcast hosting platforms. So, you know, we're a place that you can publish your episodes um, to get, get them out to Apple Podcasts and get them heard. Uh, and then there's um, uh, ad providers there's there's networks of um of of companies out there you know ad agencies that are selling advertising into podcasting so there's all sorts of terminology around all that too um so i I mean i could probably go on for an hour talking about all the terms here but are there ones that are um, most confusing to you christine that you you think people are i think sometimes people get confused between like what is a podcast provider mm-hmm. versus a media host um, mm-hmm. versus a network? I think that that can get confusing. So like from what I understand, um, you know, Libsyn, Blueberry, uh, Spreaker, these are media hosts. These are the places you upload uh, your audio mm-hmm. file. They get, you get an RSS feed, which is what a podcast right. is. Right. And that, right. that then gets distributed to a number of different providers. Right, exactly. And that right. whole, um, you know, what is a podcast is also has been an ongoing topic as well. Just, just that term podcast, what does that mean, right? And oftentimes, and I've said this for years, is that I think that term means something 
the different people. I mean, it depends on where you are in the, in the ecosystem. If you're a, a podcaster, a podcast is a very clear term, but if you're a listener, um, a podcast can be thought of, um, can be something you watch on YouTube. It could be something that you, um, it can be only available as a streaming experience. Um, you know, and I, and I think that there's a certain amount of confusion that has existed around the term podcast as well. Um, so, you know, about what that really is and what it means to be a podcast. I think that the podcasting industry has a clear understanding of it. And just like what you said, it's, it's a, an audio file that's made available uh, for download via an RSS feed, which there's a lot of new people that don't know what an RSS feed is and why do they care, right? Um, all they want to do is click a button and that's what they see when they go to Apple Podcasts. They, they just see the content there and they click a button. They don't really know what goes on from a technical perspective. And it's kind of like what happened to, to YouTube with video. It's like YouTube made it so simple um, to publish and to experience video that most people didn't need to know about the technical aspects of it. Um, and, and I think that somewhat there's pressure in the podcasting medium along those same lines. Um, is that what is the definition? And I got challenges this last week from a long-term podcaster that was like taking offense that we were trying to pigeonhole podcasts into a certain kind of definition because they felt like the, the, the potential of the medium could be expanded if we opened our minds to what the definition of a podcast is. I don't know if that opened up a Pandora's box for you, Christine, but. Well, I'm just curious, what was that argument? Like what was, what was he arguing that it could be and what were you trying to say that it is? Well, I think I was just trying to be clear to what the uh, current and long-term definition of what a podcast is um, versus um, I, I, I felt adding to a certain layer of confusion that, that opening it up too much um, and trying to call, let's say, um, an audio program that's available off of Audible, right, as a podcast when it's only behind a password protected pay firewall. Right. So uh, versus being an RSS feed that's available in Spotify and Apple podcast and Pandora and, and radio.com and iHeartRadio, that's more, you know, a, podcasting is to me has always um, meant a syndication across a variety of platforms um, via an RSS feed. Right. And if, and if you're not doing that, then it's, it's a little tough to call it a podcast because that's what a podcast started out as being. And, and I think if once we start calling audiobooks podcasts, then we, we're kind of confusing the potential audience, I think, of what a podcast is and why it's different and why it's unique. That's a good point. And that's interesting to um, share because I know that some people – are thinking, hmm, if I make these, you know, 10 episodes of a podcast um, and each episode's about an hour long and they're really, you know, well produced, then I could turn all of those episodes into a book with 10 chapters. And all of a sudden I've spent all of this time podcasting, but now I can transfer that content into a book. And that is something I think that you can do in a podcast. Right, right, exactly. But it doesn't have to be called a podcast. It can be just called an audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but if it started out as a podcast, so right. I, I see yeah. how. Yeah, it right. Can no, I can. Get confusing. And right, right. the lines can start to get blurred between what is a podcast and if it's, you know, mm -hmm. behind a paywall, like a luminary podcast, does that still make it a podcast? Or. Right. Is it something different now? Um, right. And then, it, then it's like, well, are TV shows still TV shows if they're on Netflix and you pay a subscription for Netflix? Right. So, no, no, that's exactly true. I think it's the same type of, um, type of question. I agree with you. I think um, the calling what's on Netflix a TV show is a little bit, you know, 
maybe it's off the mark, but it's culturally, that's what people understand. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I know. Exactly. He's Deep. got a show. It's called the new media show every Saturday, sometimes on Friday. <laughs> Rob dives into sometimes all sometimes on Sunday too. Things. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, so this is great because we're talking about the future of podcasting. But I, I kind of like to go back and share with our listeners, you know, how this industry started. And I believe you got your start on a local Seattle area radio station in 1999. Mm -hmm. Then right. you grew the show to national syndication on. 15 broadcast radio stations in 1999. And then your radio show was webcast in 1999 and AK podcast. Well, I and started podcasting, in, I mean, by the strict definition that we were just talking about okay. <laughs> in, in, um, in September 15th of uh, 2004. So, and it was really, a, for me at the time, most of my audience was coming from streaming and, direct downloads and off of syndication on radio and on the XM satellite radio network for a couple of years too. That's where most of my audience was back then. So podcasting was really just a matter of me adding an enclosure tag to my, my website's blog feed at the time um, that people were, you know, using with feed readers back then, which most people don't use anymore. So that's kind of old technology. That's, that is a little legacy to the podcasting um, podcasting really started based on utilizing an RSS feed that would be um, basically text-based is what it was. And for those that don't know, <laughs> which there are, I, I think, a whole other generation that have come up that don't really know what a, a blog reader is, um, that's where this medium started. And actually, most people don't also realize that Twitter was actually originally a podcast distribution company. <laughs> really? So, right. Um, they actually sold uh, what was called Odeo, which is their, their original company, um, to, to some investors, which was a, basically a podcast hosting company that, um, that existed before Apple Podcasts or iTunes existed. Um, and w when Apple Podcasts uh, um, launched in 2005 Odeo kind of shut down and they they sold the the um, IP or the software uh, for about a million dollars back then and that's they took the money and paid off some of their investors and then they took some of that money and invested in building Twitter so that's kind of there's a little bit of history around the podcasting space it's podcasting has a lot more roots deep roots in the online kind of digital media landscape than a lot of people realize. Um, and, and the only reason it grew slowly through the middle part of the podcasting was because of the explosion of social media. Um, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, they, they basically stole the thunder away from this medium um, back when they took off. Uh, and it's just been more recently that um, social media has been fairly demonized and, and, and made it, made, you know, there's a perception out there that, that those mediums are not as trusted anymore, or aren't as safe for people anymore. And it's given another window of opportunity for podcasting to kind of take off. What are you talking about when you talk, when you mean safe? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, if you look at a lot of what's been happening with social media, um, you know, the, 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 the controversy of, of um, a lot of bullying going on, a lot of, um, um, you know, kind of misinformation being, being made available on the social platforms now. Um, there's even geopolitical things going on around, you know, countries trying to get involved in elections and things like that. So there's a lot of people starting to, to drop their Facebook accounts now. So you have a, a trust issue that's going on around social media and that's one of the strengths that podcasting has is that it's, it's very personal, it's very authentic, and it's, it's not an area where there's been a lot of abuse. Um, though there's some examples out there, but um, generally it's considered to be a pretty safe medium. So who's abused the podcasting industry? <laughs> who's, who's abused the podcasting industry? Well, 
there is a certain amount of players that have been involved in the in the medium that um, have done some nefarious things. Um, like uh, uh, there's people out there that are selling placement in um, in Apple. Um, they're promising getting featured, and they have like rows and rows of iPhones that they can game the Apple algorithm to try and get shows placed high in the rankings. So really? yeah, you can pay to have that done. Um, but Apple has developed ways that they can detect that and ban you for doing those type of things to get um, higher rankings in Apple. Can you uh, give me an example of someone who's been banned for doing that? <laughs> No, I can't actually. So um, I don't, I mean, honestly, I don't really know because um, I haven't really been um, hearing about it, but I, I do hear um, from Apple and I do hear from others in the medium that um, have said that that's been going on. And I get constantly hit up from what they call podcast promoters out there. And I think a lot of podcasters are getting uh, reached out to, um, to, you know, just pay, you know, a certain amount of money and we will guarantee, you know, top placement in, in Apple podcast ranking charts. Um, and then they'll have like these rows and rows of iPhones, old, older iPhones that they can just go through and they, they subscribe and subscribe, subscribe, you know, like over and over and over again to try and game the algorithm um, to try and get higher rankings but it's not real audience. So it's fake. Oh, yeah. Um, and then other doing this with social media followers, right? And there's other companies that will, you can go in and buy downloads too. You can, you can pay a certain amount of money and this company will turn on some bots that will come in and, and um, click on your links, essentially your download links for you. Um, but most of the hosting platforms have, have developed um, countermeasures for that. And actually it's part of the IEB V2 spec that um, platforms are getting certified around is to block um, bot uh, requests for media files. Um, and just kind of ignore those things or in some of the platforms have, have, have developed um, ways to create what's called blacklists um, that will ban certain IP addresses from being able to request uh, media files. Um, so there's all sorts of, you know, cyber warfare going on, even in the podcasting space. A lot of people don't realize it, but it's been going on for a long time. Wow. Well, you heard it here first. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and controversial. Yeah. We're, I feel yes. like we're getting a little too inside baseball. Well, this is the kind of stuff that we talk about on the new media show. So this is, this is kind of the, the stuff that people don't like to talk about too much. Yeah. Um, well, I find it fascinating. I think that's because my background's in uh, investigative reporting. <laughs> so mm, there I'm, you go. I can see where, where we're heading down that for path. More information. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I would like to talk to you about your current role. So we actually met a few months ago at uh, the National Association of Broadcasters Convention in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and that was really fun. There was a lot of really great information about the industry coming out. And at that point, you were working at Box and Spreaker, yep. and now you've made a transition with Libsyn, and right. you're the VP of Content and Partnerships. So what does that mean? What does that mean? I'm still trying to trying to clarify that um, actually, because I stepped into a a role with a company that has deep roots in the medium, and I'm 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 now surrounded by people that are uh, peers around expertise in the medium. You know, like uh, Rob Walsh and and Dave Jackson and Elsie Escobar. All these folks are you know part of the podcast Hall of Fame. They're, they're really my peers in this medium. They've been around a long time. So they're all experts. They've been around uh, Lipson for over a decade, um, most of them. So I'm, I'm like the, the green new guy, even though that I've been podcasting as long or longer than any of them. Uh, and I've worked at, you know, I used to work at a small company called Microsoft and ran the Zoom podcasting platform for, for many years too. So I've been around this medium and I've been a customer of Lipson's for many years back when I worked at, at uh, Microsoft, actually, I, I hosted 60 
um, podcasts, Zoom podcasts um, on the Lipson Pro platform. So back in 2008, back in the early days of that, that tool. Um, so I've been a long-term customer of the company as well. Um, though the platform has changed quite a bit since um, I was using the tool. So I'm, I'm still learning the platform and, and learning um, how it all works. And, and Rob Walsh has been a terrific um, kind, of, kind of mentor for me and the company to get me up to speed with what's going on over there. I spent four years at Spreaker. So I, I, I consider myself an expert at Spreaker, <laughs> but so I don't consider... Exactly? And Spreaker is a media host as well. Right. And, and what's different about Spreaker is that they did um, live streaming too. So it, it combined live streaming with podcasting in its platform at its, at its core. And there was production tools and all sorts of stuff. So I had a lot of, um, lot in the toolkit. Um, but Lipson is what I consider to be a really more of a serious professional podcast hosting platform. I um, mean, a lot of big media companies use Lipson because they just have capabilities that nobody else in the medium has built uh, just because they've been around since 2004. So um, they've had lots of time to, to, to develop very advanced techniques on how to take advantage of um, this podcast medium. Yeah. Well, you know, we actually um, had Rob Walsh on the show. Oh, you did? Um, yes, I did. So I feel this podcast um, is is a little lips and heavy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay, though. It's okay, though. I think you've got, you know, Rob's a terrific guy, and he, he's he's clearly an expert in this medium. Um, and, and is a good, is a great resource to anybody. And, and he's such a great guy too. So i I enjoy working with him and, um, start helping podcasters and that's, that's and building and continuing to build the, the relationships that I have with, um, external companies as well, like Apple and Google and, and the Amazon folks, um, to help advance the, the medium and thus advance the, the Lipson platform. And we just spoke the other day, you were on your way to Apple Podcasts. Right. Can yeah. you share any insider knowledge about that meeting? What was that about? <laughs> well, like I've known the, the Apple podcasting folks um, since the very early days. I mean, there's been new people down there that have come in um, in the span of time that I've been involved in the medium. Um, but most of the folks down there have been around um, the Apple podcasting um, world for, for many years now. So it, there's a lot of old, old friends down there. And, and I, I met with six people from the Apple podcast team. And there, there are quite a few people down there that are working on the Apple podcasting platform. So, you know, they're very engaged in the medium. Um, they want to hear feedback from the, the space. I spent an hour with them sharing and, and um, trying to come up with ideas on things that the Apple could consider doing in the future and, and ways that they can improve and, and, and thus, you know, looking for feedback from them about what Lipson can do to help them and to improve as well. So there's just a, a constant flow of ideas and, and suggestions coming in from all sides. And I, as I talk to all the companies out there, whether it be Amazon or, or Google or any of these folks, um, there's a constant exchange of, of ideas and, and suggestions um, that, that exchange back and forth. So we can better cater to the needs of listeners and the better in the needs of podcasters. And that's, that's what we're all about. And that's, that's what I've been doing for years is thinking about both sides of that and trying to make this medium better. Well, do you think that Apple Podcasts is planning to make any changes anytime soon? And what would those changes be? Well, they, they just announced some changes. Um, they're going to finally, after 15 years, um, make some changes to their categorization. And that's coming here, um, I would say, probably sometime in the next couple months. Um, they're going to switch over to, uh, to some significant changes in the category categorization of, of, of shows and they're going to modernize it based on the changes in the various types of genres of content that are now in the medium. Um, I've been saying for, for years that we needed this change like 10 years ago. I mean, um, so it's a long time coming. 
Um, I think that there's some of the changes that they are making are a little controversial and maybe Apple didn't go far enough. Um, like there's, what? Uh, there are some categories that um, I think some people feel are, are going to be underserved. They, they drop some categories like they, they drop the, uh, the podcasting category. <laughs> But it totally makes sense um, that they dropped that because a lot of people were confused by that. It's like they thought because they had a podcast that they needed to be listed in the podcast category. So where is podcasting made easy going to fall? Um, well, it's going to probably fall in the in the business category would be my, my speculation at this point, uh, which is probably where it needs to be. You know, maybe it's a... Maybe it needs to be a more of a media category or something like that. Or, a, um, but I think it's going to fall in the the business area. I think, and, and that's probably where it belongs. Um, having a podcast category is just confusing, in my opinion. But but that's that that's part of the controversy, right? What Not everybody will... agrees with that. Yeah, but what do you think these categories, changing these categories, adding categories, getting rid of some categories, what will that mean for today's podcaster? It just means that uh, there's going to be some adjustments that um, all podcasters are going to need to make um, potentially to their categorization that they have in their RSS feeds. So they, all, all of the host providers are going to need to communicate with the podcasters and say, you know, as of this date, you need to go in and make some adjustments to your, um, your, your Apple podcasts um, categorization that you have in your RSS feed. Um, so when Apple turns it on, on their end, that you will be properly indexed. And some of the categories that are getting um, eliminated are basically going to um, take those shows and roll them up um, one level, right? So if you were in the business category under podcasting, right? Podcasting was the subcategory of the business section. Um, what you'll do is you'll just roll up to the business category. Not, um, it's not like your your listing is going to disappear. It's just going to going to shift because that subcategory is going to disappear. Um, and then there's going to be new categories that you might want to consider for your podcast too. Like there's a true true crime category. So there hasn't been really any category for our and kind of reality-based storytelling. Um, and, and that's, there was like, I think the literary um, category, which was, you know, or news uh, was the closest, I think that any of those true crime podcasts could get to a category that was relevant to them. So now they're going to have a true crime category, which in some ways maybe doesn't make sense. Maybe it needs to be categorization of reality-based storytelling or, fictional storytelling or something like that w would have been a better type of categorization um, or drama or, um, you know, crime or something, you know, I, there's a lot of, um, and Apple definitely gave me the impression that they went through thousands of categories, uh, you know, as ideas and they filtered them down based on feedback from the team and in the greater, you know, kind of Apple community that they, they communicated to to try and filter this down to come up with these new categorizations because it is a it did open up some some controversy when they announced it so something that we've i've seen in the past is that it's really helpful for podcasters to really niche their podcast um mm -hmm. and right. will this make it more difficult for people to really dig in and niche themselves out no, I think it's it's going to probably improve it because um, the categorization that they, and I don't have it right in front of me to be able to address certain categories, but I would think that they're going to clarify um, more popular categories of niche content. Um, so some of the new categories that they're adding are going to be able to expose um, certain uh, niches of content that weren't being exposed before. So I think, you know, around sports and news and tech and things like that, there's going to be more, uh, more alignment with actual content that's available in the medium where we're just keep in mind this category 
that Apple has was created in 2005, um, back when maybe there was 2,000 podcasts. And now there's 703,000 podcasts across probably so many more genres of content. Back then, it was very heavy towards technology podcasts and and talking about tech stuff and comedy and things like that were the were the dominant genres in the in in today maybe in uh, religion is one of the top categories in podcasting believe it or not so um so there was some clarification around that one that they did as well it's great to have some more categories. I think that it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out. Um, you know, you mentioned there's 700,000 podcasts in existence currently mm -hmm. on Apple Podcasts, but how many of them are really not active? Right now, it's about 200,000 that are actually active. Yep, it's yeah. about 280,000 um, have had, a, a, had at least one episode published in the last 90 days. And that's according to some research that was done by Daniel J. Lewis, um, who's a longtime podcaster in this medium, who's kind of kind of a, you know, he's one of those early podcasters that was a geek. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's he's diving into the data. He's actually starting a company around kind of exposing this data that hasn't existed before. I mean, like downloads. And so you can actually see everybody's downloads. No, I don't think he's going to go that far. I think it's more around, you know, the population of the podcasting um, um, catalog, right? How many podcasts are in there? How frequently are they being published? What's the, what's the, the count of podcasts based on categories you know, these kind of big picture issues that has been needed. I mean, it would be great if we had um, kind of like global data around how many people, how many people like in the last year have downloaded a podcast, you know, Apple will occasionally put out some data that, you know, we passed a billion downloads or something like that. But I think that was like five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, so we're well past it. I know just Lipson alone has had billions and billions of downloads. So it's, it's uh, it's a medium that needs some exposure of kind of big picture um, numbers and perspective, right, on what's happening with the medium, how it's growing, how many new shows are being added every month. Um, not granular stuff that's going to get into people's privacy or expose people's, you know, data, right? I think that that's another area of this medium that we have to be very careful of, too, is... Um, you know, privacy and not violating that trust with people. Where are we right now in the podcasting industry, in the podcasting world? If, if there's a new podcaster out there trying to figure out what is this or someone who's thinking about starting a podcast and they're just trying to figure out, do they fit in? What are they getting themselves into? How would you describe the current state of podcasting? Um, I would say that the big thing to think about is doing something that uh, is relatively unique. And I think as you think about your show, I think you need to really focus on what your needs are as a podcaster. And, and then also think about your audience, right? Who you're trying to reach. And, and I think your, your goals need to be very focused, right? to get started with. And, and I think, you know, the future of the, the medium is very bright. Um, I think that there's, it's going to be easier for people to get to the content as we are starting to see, you know, Apple is now going to start transcribing audio um, to help people better discover podcasts. Um, there's more um, AI that's being applied or and machine intelligence is being applied to this this medium more and more. And that's one of the fallouts from the increasing in monetization. Uh, as people are starting to make more money in this medium, there's going to be more investment in technology. And that, that's been one of the things that has held the medium back from the very early days is there was a lot of software companies that just didn't want to invest in the medium because there was no return on it. Um, that's one of the, the downsides of being an open um, formatted 
medium is that is that there weren't a lot of commercial interests involved. You know, I spent six years working on the Zoom podcasting platform, and that was one of the big things that I struggled with at the company, uh, a big company like Microsoft that was um, in the business of making billions of dollars. Is you know, what's in it for me? I mean, if you think about it from the from a company perspective, that why should the company invest in developers and and resources for something that's not going to bring any return. So, you know, that's what one of the big things too that has changed and is very, very um, good good for the medium is that people are starting to make money from this. And I think as you approach this medium, um, you have to be thinking about um, what can I, how can I benefit from from doing a podcast and get very clear on that as well. How. So that's what people should ask themselves is how they can personally benefit right. from a and, podcast. And how they can, they can benefit an audience too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those are, those are important things too, but keep in mind, this is a word of mouth medium. You're building relationships with people that will um, you would hope, or you need to ask for, they will share with their friends. They will, um, make suggestions either your best marketing method for building your audience with your podcast is your audience. And there's more and more data that's coming out that's showing that um, is, is the key way you're not going to grow your audience by spending a lot of time in social media, pushing your podcast. What you need to do is focus on the content and make the content compelling enough for your audience to be such big fans of you as a person and you as a show that they're going to tell their friends and that's, what's going to grow this medium more than anything else that you can do. What have you seen personally with your podcast? I know you've done the new media podcast for, what'd you say? 15 years now? Uh, it's uh, the new media show, which wasn't always called the new media show. I've been doing it for 11 years. Um, me. And then, but prior to that, I did my radio show for six years and then I did, um, I did like three, Three podcasts for the Zoom podcasting platform too, um, on on a variety of topics. So, <laughs> do you feel comfortable sharing where you started with your downloads and with your audience engagement? I'm more than happy to talk about that because, you know, one of the things that um, that many podcasters needs to realize is that um, you don't have to have a huge big show to be successful in podcasting. And it depends on your niche. It depends on the topic. It depends on the niche, what your opportunity is to scale to a large audience, right? If the more you niche down, the fewer people you're going to have as a pool or resource to reach. So, um, but at the end of the day, it's not necessarily about the big numbers. Now, it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are to have an advertising business, you need to, pick a niche or pick a topic that will scale large. But if your goals are to get very narrow and reach a very focused community, um, your podcast may not be that large. So you need to figure out a way to benefit from a smaller audience. Um, And there's ways to do that, right? It's all about the connection that you have. And often podcasters will, will look at, at a small audience and say, well, what what really counts is who's listening, not how many people are listening. Um, so there's that spectrum. And then there's the other, the advertising spectrum where it's like, you know, if I'm like a Joe Rogan or something like that, I've got millions of downloads. That's great. You know, and if you can build that, that creates a great advertising opportunity. But if you want to really nicheify what you're doing, get it very focused and very narrow, you're maybe only going to reach a few hundred uh, listeners. But who are those people? And how, how can you build a deep relationship with them that can drive value to you um, and that's and drive value to them? And that's the, the personal nature of this medium. So when you talk to your listener, you're talking to one person. You know, you're, you need to refer to them as you, not all of you, if, if you understand what that distinction is. We're like a Joe Rogan. He, he can speak at a much broader tone, but he still needs to be focused on the individual, not the community. He needs to talk to one person. And I think that's the key to, to podcast success is understanding that dynamic of 
where you are around a niche content or a more broad content that is trying to reach. It depends on what your goals are and what your talents are and what you're capable of doing and what you want to do. So. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is kind of a, a really in-depth audience analysis and, and making an avatar. And that is something I would suggest every podcaster, every uh, person who wants to tell a story in almost any medium, they really right. think about who they're talking to directly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to be a TV news reporter and I'd be on air every day. And um, for me, this was uh, something I really didn't always feel comfortable with. I don't always feel comfortable being in front of the camera and, yeah. uh, or especially a large crowd of people. Goodness, I did find that being in front of a camera was much easier because um, then a big crowd because it was only like one camera and then I could pretend that camera is anybody I know, anybody it's I like a person, know. right? Yeah. One person. So I that's what I would do. I was I would think of the camera as one person who I wanted to tell the story to, mm -hmm. somebody who would be in the audience. And a lot of times I would think of talking to my mom or to my best friend mm -hmm. or just to someone to really share with them in a a caring, authentic, open, objective way about what was going on. And I found that when I remembered to do that, the story always seemed to come across much better than if I got overwhelmed by the idea that a million people are watching me right now. <laughs> yeah, it could be a little scary, right? Yeah. When you think about that, right? No, I, I totally get it. And I, mean, I started out not being being a presenter at all. I you know back when I was like I was a younger younger man um, and a kid. I didn't like talking at all. So it was it was I was a very quiet person. And in some ways, podcasting has allowed me to kind of um, get better at communicating um, more at a smaller kind of group level. And then I could kind of build up to larger audiences. And now I can I can present, you know, keynotes and up on stage, but that took many years to get to that point where I felt comfortable doing those kinds of things. Um, and, but podcasting allowed me to start communicating with larger amounts of people in a more personal kind of environment, right? And kind of getting in front of a microphone with maybe one or two other people in the room or something like that was much easier for me at the time. So um, I'm going to bring you back to, okay. to the original question. Right. <laughs> Was is can you tell me kind of where you started with your show with Todd Cochran if you feel comfortable um, when it comes to downloads and your audience size right. and maybe even who your audience your avatar is yeah. who do you think of when you're talking with well Todd? yeah yeah I mean I, I think um, when we started the new media show and this basically applies to any of the podcasts that I've done. Um, they, it started out humble. I mean, at the beginning, you, you don't have anybody listening. So, you know, and that's, that's when you need to learn fast, um, and, and get better. Um, so numbers in the, you know, the, the less than a hundred, um, have been very much a part of my past. Um, and then, and then as you get better at the show or whatever, you ramp up like, like the new media show today, is getting about um, seven to twelve thousand people uh, listening per episode right now, um, and that's on a global scale. Um, but I've done like the show that I did for Spreaker. Um, it's called the Spreaker Live Show, and that was a live um, program that I did on the Spreaker platform. Every week, I did about 184 episodes. That show was averaging around um, uh, between four and eight hundred downloads per episode. Um, so that was, that was one of the smaller shows that I've done, but it was very niche, very focused on supporting the Spreaker uh, podcasting community, right? So most of my, I would say more than half of my listeners were listening directly off of the Spreaker listening platform. Um, and the other half were listening on the, um, the podcast catcher applications out there like Apple podcasts and things like that. So there's um, another jargon for you. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and then other shows that I've done like the Zoom insider podcasts um, um, that, that garnered over the 
three, three years, four years that I did that show, about 5 million downloads of that show. Um, and then, and I think, I think we did like 140, 150 episodes of that show. Um, so it started out small too, but that, that was with a big company and had a lot of exposure and things like that, which had, had a lot of, a lot of advantages to it. Um, definitely. And my, on my radio show, which was, um, I started in 99, that, uh, ramped up, um, you know, from what I could forecast now, radio is hard to count what your audience is, but, um, around a million listeners a month to that show. Um, on the podcasting side, I think, you know, back when I was distributing as a podcast, I didn't have very good metrics because I had my own servers that I was hosting that on. Um, Lipson didn't really, you know, exist yet when I started making my show available online. Um, so I had my own server infrastructure. Um, and I, I, I was hosting other people's, other radio shows, um, podcasts back at that time too, before Lipson existed. Um, so in some ways I was doing a lot of the same stuff that we see in the medium today, but before podcasting started, um, it, it just yeah. wasn't called podcasting at that time. So. And people out there who are, who are listening, um, and, and wondering about, you know, having a place, a server, this is something that a media hosting company like Libsyn will absolutely take care of for you. Right. There's so, no reason for you to, to worry about it anymore. I mean, a lot of the things that you're talking about, Rob, are things that weren't, that are currently no longer an issue for people. <laughs> right. Right. And that's, that's the big takeaway from this is, is that that's how far this medium has gone. I mean, we've, we've gone to having um, a boatload of companies out there that are, that basically have a, have automated this podcasting thing more and more every year. I know that that was the big thing that I worked on it at Spreaker and uh, was trying to make things easier, like one click submission to these listening platforms, you know, those kind of concepts uh, never existed before. I had to hand code my RSS feed when I started. Um, so we just, yeah, right. Not I mean, podcasting made easy. No, it's not. And I mean, I mean, unless you were very technically oriented, um, you weren't getting a show out the door. There no. was just no way to do it. So, so, so it's easier now is the bottom line. <laughs> go, go get it done is what they say. Yes. <laughs> now, now it's much easier for you to, to go ahead and start podcasting right. and putting it out into the world. And if you're still curious about how to do it, keep listening. <laughs> so we'll, make, right. we'll make sure we make sure that you feel comfortable and that you can go ahead and, uh, and get started and get, get rolling. Um, right. Do you feel Just there is still, it, uh, what was that? <laughs> Just do it, right? I mean, Just do it. Uh, not to steal Nike's tagline, but just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Do you feel there is still room to grow? Should people be intimidated by the fact that there's 280,000 shows out there? I don't think so. I think that there's still unmet needs out there. And, and I think each of us are so unique in how we look at the world that I think that there's plenty of room for new ideas. Um, and that's what's been around this medium from day one is that so much experimentation and so much exploration of new ideas um, keep them coming, you know, as, as this medium um, becomes more diverse, um, a lot more women like yourself getting involved in the medium, uh, I think has expanded its capabilities to, to add genres of content that, you know, life experience brings, um, you know, back when this medium started, it was a bunch of, you know, white guys and geeks and our spectrum of knowledge was pretty limited. <laughs> So, so I think that the opportunity for different cultures and different languages and, and podcasting is expanding on a global scale. Um, I think over the next five years, I think most of the, the major expansion that's going to happen in this medium is going to come from outside of the United States. Oh, wow. Other, other countries around the world. And we're already seeing it starting to happen. I mean, podcasting down in South America is exploding right now. Um, and it's uh, happening more and more in Europe. And in Asia, um, it's it's really starting to you know expand. Canada, Canada actually has a higher per capita um, podcast listening um, um, stats than the U.S. 
So there's more people listening to more podcasts on a weekly and monthly basis in Canada than in the U S. So if that gives you any kind of indication of where this medium is heading, uh, it's, it's truly becoming a global medium. So are there new uh, podcast providers that are coming out in those countries or are, you know, people in, let's say Guatemala uh, listening just via Apple podcasts, just like we are. It's yeah. All the same. Well, I think that that's, that's or, also true as well. I mean, if you look outside of the United States though, the dominant um, mobile platform is Android. So Apple pod, Apple, go Google. <laughs> that's right. Go, go Google. You can see why I spend a lot of time at Google now trying to, trying to get those guys to get their, their, their stuff together um, is because the growth of this medium is going to come out of Android. And I was trying to persuade Apple to, to put an Apple app, Apple podcast app on Android too. So, you know, let's, let's try and make it as easy as possible for Android users to get access to this medium too. Because if you look at the, the, the research, um, and this is also reflective off of the Lipson platform, it's like a, a four and a half to one ratio, five to one ratio of consumption of podcasts on Apple devices versus Android devices. So if we can get that on par, you know, like maybe, you know, 50, 50, um, we basically have doubled the podcast medium, probably tripled it because there's so many more Android users than there are Apple users. Wow. That's crazy because like 75% of the people who listen are listening, or at least according to data I've seen, Right. I was seeing on Apple podcasts right? Exactly. with their iPhone. Right. But and that's only, there's more Android. Listen. That's right. That's only 20% of the mobile devices that exist yeah. in the world. Yeah. So, you know, you start thinking about that other 80%. Now, granted, we're never going to hit hundred percent. There's nothing that's ever hit. I mean, it's like smartphone adoption, I think has peaked at like 80%. Um, so, you know, th that's probably as much as we're ever going to get is 80 percent um but that would be that'd be like tripling or quadrupling the podcast space well rob i have a couple more questions for you but i am aware of the time do you have time to yes. answer a couple more questions or do we sure, know sure. Oh, okay let's do it all right <laughs> <laughs> um I, I do want to be respectful of your time so um but if i can get more information out of you <laughs> You're going to squeeze that orange, huh? No. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. We have an orange tree in our backyard. And um, I, I gave my son an orange this morning. He's 14 months. And he just like. I used to work for the Florida Department of Citrus for five years. Actually, I built the world's largest glass of orange juice. So if that tells you. What? Yeah. If you do a, if you do a search in Google under the world's largest glass of orange juice, you'll find my, my creation. So Gosh, this sounds like a Jeopardy question. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. No, but it's, it's, it's real. It's real. I did it back in 1997. Was I this a, a PR stunt? I used to be a, a marketing person for the Florida Citrus Commission. So up here in the Northwest, up in the, the, the Seattle area. So for, for five years, I, I did marketing and advertising campaigns for the Florida, Florida citrus space, um, maybe like Tropicana orange juice and Minute Maid and fresh, fresh oranges and grapefruit and things like that too. So wow. yeah, nothing like Speaking a orange juice <laughs> glass of fresh citrus, right? This podcast brought to you by, <laughs> by floridajuice.com. No, <laughs> See if you can get a, a coupon code for them. All right. 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 Well, I'm sure it exists. Yeah. Um, so what I was wondering is, you know, if a, someone is going to start a podcast and they want to do it next week, mm -hmm. what are three tools that they should have to execute their podcast launch mm -hmm. successfully? Well, um, there's a couple different ways that you can look at that. It depends on what your definition of a tool is. Um, if, if I look at it from a purely technical perspective, I mean, you obviously need to have a microphone, you need to have a way to record, and you need to have a way of publishing it and distributing it. 
right? So, um, but I wouldn't say oh, that those are the host. first. Yeah, exactly. A, a, a immediate host. Um, though I wouldn't say that those are the first things you should do. I think the first things that you should do is get um, get your turn your creative mind on, right? And start coming up with some ideas on what you want to do with your show and and set some goals, um, and and then get your equipment. Once you have an understanding of of what you want to produce, then you can more uh, more effectively and more cost efficiently come up with the proper equipment that you need, um, and and what mic what type of microphone to use, and what type of recording situation, and what type of distribution platform you need to work with, to you know and there's a lot of research that needs to go into each of those things um, as you stop, start down this path. Um, because as I can attest to, you know, you start out at the beginning and you think you have an idea of what you want to do to some degree. It doesn't have to be very complicated, but uh, I have a stockpile of microphones, if that tells you anything. Um, of ones that I've, I started with and then I moved on to something else and then I moved on to something else. All right. So, you know, you can easily waste a bunch of money, um, because you didn't think about what you were doing beforehand. So, um, I would just get up as crisp as you can. Now, granted you are going to change and that's what you want to do. You want to improve and you want to do things better, but you also need to have a budget. You need to understand how much you're willing to invest in doing a podcast. I think you can start out on a very low budget and I think you can grow into your podcast based on success and the movement towards success. You can keep improving because when you start a podcast, you're not going to have that many listeners, right? So, you know, the, the, the old saying goes fail fast um, definitely applies here, right? So don't, I also advise podcasters to not stockpile a bunch of episodes before they launch for this exact reason is that when you start producing episodes, you're going to change it each time you do an episode, right? And you need to take feedback from places um, to, to learn, right? And to improve and get better because as you get better, your audience is going to grow. But if you produce a bunch of episodes on, under a certain kind of a thinking process, in advance, you're locked into that, right? How would you, how many episodes would you suggest someone launch with? I would, I would launch, um, well, first of all, I would create a promo episode first, mm -hmm. um, which would be like a 30, 30 to 45 second episode that um, previews what your show is about. It's like a movie trailer, but I would do it for your podcast and publish that first and get your distribution built because most of the platforms require at least one episode to generate an RSS feed and to get into the catalog and then set a future date to when you want to launch your first episode. Um, and, and I probably wouldn't launch with any more than maybe two, three episodes max because you don't want to fall into a trap of pre-producing under a certain assumption before you've started your process. And getting um, but, feedback. Right, exactly. Because then you're then you're locked into a format that maybe doesn't work, um, and and learning is the most important thing that you need to key on at the beginning of the podcast. Um, I typically would just, I mean, myself, I would produce it each week. I would just, I would start out with one and go to two and then go to three and space them out, because you can learn between each episode and improve and make it better. Um, each time. But if you pre-produce your, you know, what you may happen is that you create your first episode, you publish it, you get feedback and you say, oh, I can't use that next episode that I already produced because it didn't work. Right. Um, and then you just wasted all your time. So that's the, that's the concern that I have. I mean, certain people can probably get away with it and it will work fine depending on how much planning and advanced thought that they put into the production. Um, but I would say in a general sense, I, I wouldn't pre-produce a lot. Mm -mm. So are there any, um, actual specific systems that you find are helpful tools? And when I say systems, I mean, say, uh, 
like Asana, which is a workflow project management system, or um, the Google calendars, or is there a specific, when I say tool, I mean, are there, is, is there, are there any yeah. tools mm-hmm. that, yeah, I would say, used that you have found to be right. like so thankful that that was there for you while right. moving forward in your podcasting? Journey? Right. I, I, I would say that any kind of a document sharing platform, I think is helpful, especially if you have co-hosts um, and, and guests. Kind of like what you did with with me with this show. Um, you shared a document with me that kind of had questions and had a format, um, though we didn't follow it 100%, um, but that's that's okay. But what you did was you organized your thoughts. So a document sharing tool, I think, whether it be Google Docs or, um, or it could be Word, you can just exchange a, you know, a, a a document. It can be a notepad. It can be a text document. It doesn't have to be anything. There, there are tools out there that you can use like Slack and other things that can, can work for this. Um, I think that's one tool. I think another one, um, depending on how you want to record, um, you know, if you have a tool that uh, will re- record Skype conversations, you now Skype actually enables recording now. So you can you can use Skype to record your 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 conversations with your co-hosts. Um, there's all sorts of tools out there that you can utilize to to record your show. Um, I think those are important tools as well. Um, I think an, another tool would be um, having some some sort of a call-in phone number, a call-in line like an Uber conference or a free conference call.com uh, phone number that you can give your audience to call in and leave a message for you or something. Or um, there's, a, there's a bunch of tools out there that you can utilize for that type of um, engagement with your listening audience. So um, I would say those are the, the key. I mean, obviously you need to have a way to record your show too. It could be, um, um, you know, a free software program called, called Audacity is available out there. I use a little software program called Levelator, um, which was, has been around um, since 2005. Um, it's at uh, levelator.com. Or actually, I don't know if it's at levelator.com, but it's, it's called uh, Levelator. And it's basically a little tool that you drag and drop uh, WAV files into that will completely normalize and level the entire uh, recording. Because oftentimes people will record your an episode in segments and the volume levels will be all over the place. And it's just a way to drop in your production and have it all be uh, leveled um, right out of the, you know, and then take that wave file after it's been um, um, leveled and, and encode it into an MP3 file. So, um, you know, while we were chatting, I wrote down budget question mark, question mark. What do you feel people should expect to budget out when they start podcasting? I would expect probably to, you, you can start out really inexpensively if you want, depending on what you, what you want. There, there are applications that you can get for your mobile device um, that you can record directly into. You don't even have to buy a microphone or anything like that. You just, um, you know, like an iPhone has, you know, like a, regular, regular headphones, right? Uh, you could conceivably do your podcasts like that into like a, like a free recording software that's that, that you can get in the Apple um, app store um, and record your show like that to get started with. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get started, um, but you do need to think about quality too. So, you know, it, th- there are really good microphones that you can get um, that are like, $50, $60 that sound terrific. Um, that are like just USB microphones you can plug into your computer and, and, and record and sound terrific. And I think that's pretty much all you really need to have. You know, I know I have a, you know, I have a three or $400 microphone here um, that, that I, I believe in and I have a, you know, a recording setup. So you could spend, you know, I think you can get enough for what you need maybe for 500 bucks and you'll be good to go. Um, for and that's also with the media host included and probably, yeah, I think it's, it's reasonable to, to have a pretty good sounding podcast for spending, you know, 
five hundred dollars. I mean, you can get away with it um, with starting it for probably a hundred bucks uh, with with media hosting and microphone and a place to record. So, yeah, I think it's possible to do all that. Perfect. Um, is there any other tips for success that you'd like to share? Be passionate about what you're doing. I think is the big thing. You know, people are, are attracted to people that have passion and people that have um, energy and are positive. And I think those are the keys to building community is, is be inspirational, be thoughtful, be engaging. Um, it's all around um, people are looking for people to connect with that um, can inspire them and help them and make them feel better about their own lives. And that's, that's the key to, to building an audience in podcasting is, is, you know, being a good person and being, being there for your audience uh, and being reliable for your audience as well is uh, I think some podcasters can, can, can get away with not being regular with their, with their podcasts. But if you're really building um, a deep connection with your audience, you're basically building a group of friends is what you're doing. And how would you treat your friend? Would you not meet them at the, at Starbucks for after you said that you were going to be there for them? And I think that's, that's something to keep in mind too, when you're doing a podcast is that you're building friends. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to keep, keep those people in mind because they're taking time out of their lives to, to connect with you and are looking for you to, to be there for them. And that's how I, I look at podcasting myself personally. I've been that way for years. Well, I think those are some great tips, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Also touching. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that's, that's important about this medium is that, you know, um, uh, listeners are, um, have a valuable time in their, their lives and they're spending it with you. So you have to respect that. Um, before we go, what podcast are you listening right now? Listening oh. to what podcast you wrote five on the sheet, <laughs> which, <laughs> well, those are, those are the ones that I've, I've listened to most frequently, as you might imagine, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I mean, I've had at times a, um, close to 200 subscriptions in my, my podcast pool that I've, I, because I have to listen to so many um, to give feedback to, to, to people. So, but I would say my, my regular drivers is I love, I'm a geek at heart and I'm a marketing guy, but I'm also a, a geek. So I, I love thinking about the future and I love thinking about what's important out there. I like the show, The Future of Everything. It's done by the, the, the Wall Street Journal and Podcasters Roundtable, which I've been a guest on many times. I was just listening to it last night. And actually, that's a live video show as well. And I also listen to the Rachel Maddow show too. So trying to keep up with what's happening in the world of politics. And uh, Windows Weekly is my, my, my connection to my many years at Microsoft. So I'm, I'm, I'm friends with all the people that are involved in that show. Um, and those are my main, my main drivers of what I listen to. But like I said, I listen to a lot of different podcasts, um, to give people feedback on their programs. Oh, well, perfect. Thanks for sharing. And, um, lastly, you know, where can people find you? Um, I can be found, uh, on Twitter at Rob Greenlee and that's with two E's, um, and then I'm all, I also have my own website at um, robgreenlee.com. And I can be found at the, at the podcast newmediashow.com as well. Uh, it's a great place to find me over there. I'm not hard to find online. Uh, or, or you can just send me an email, um, robg at libson.com. I'd be more than happy to talk to you if you're interested in podcasting. So as you, that probably won't be a big surprise. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Like I started, you know, I mentioned in the introduction of this episode is that, you know, when we met, there were so many things going on and there were so many people and like experts and just, there was a lot of just stuff happening in the environment right. we were in at NAB. And right. I just found that you gave me all of your attention and you were like, do you need help in the podcasting world? 
right. has I, let me help you. And I was just surprised. I was like, does he mean it? Right, of course. <laughs> Is of course. he distracted by the shiny thing that just went by me or that? Oh, I, I, I get distracted, no question about it. But but I also, you know, bring it back to, to focus on, on people and especially yeah. if they're interested in podcasting. It's like the, the perfect nexus for me and my 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 little lizard brain around what, podcasting. <laughs> what kind of people do you feel podcasting attracts? I think it attracts people that uh, are extroverts somewhat, even though I was an introvert <laughs> when I started this. Um, it's it's breaking through your your fears. Uh, I think it, it attracts people that are brave. Um, and I think people that um, are, are er- yearning to garner some attention for themselves. And I think there are also folks that are wanting to help the world um, and help others. I think that's been some of the key things that um, have come out of the, the, the legacy of podcasting. As I think back to all the people that I've, I've been exposed to over the years that have been involved in this medium for a long time. And I hope it continues into the next generation uh, is the, is the willingness to share and build community. Um, I think there's a tendency in the, the, the new generation to kind of become um, stray cats of, of sorts and run off in different directions. And, um, and I, I just hope that the next generation of leaders in this medium um, can, can maintain those values. And on that note, yes. <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of podcasting made easy. And, um, and we'll include all of Rob's information in the show notes. If you guys would like to learn more, uh, make sure to check out our show notes and please make sure to leave me some feedback online so that I can uh, share with you what you'd like to hear more of right here on Podcasting Made Easy. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for listening to Podcasting Made Easy. I'd love to learn more about you. What topic would you like me to cover? Who would you like me to interview? Please fill out the survey in the show notes so that I can serve you best. If you're listening on iTunes, remember to subscribe, rate, and review. You can also find me on Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Please share this podcast with your friends, especially if you think they should be podcasting. If you have any other questions or suggestions, you can email me at hello at podcastingmadeeasy.com. You can also find me on social media at the Christine OD. Thanks for listening and have a great day.